The topic for discussion, as you can see on the screen, is Shami Vivekananda's thoughts on education. He was a great saint, a great philosopher, and a great spiritual giant. And save ourselves from destroying our Mother Earth. Does India have something to contribute to the crisis that is facing humanity? The great monk, Swami Vivekananda, roared the message of the fundamental spiritual unity of life on September 11, 1893, in the Parliament of Religions in Chicago, precisely to answer these questions. Sisters and brothers of America. These loving words were enough to captivate everyone. Vivekananda once said, I have a message to the West as Buddha had a message to the East. I shall not cease to work. I shall inspire men everywhere until the world shall know that it is one with God. Who was this man? How did he reach the shores of America, Europe, and so many countries around the world? Let us embark upon this journey, a tale that begins in the outskirts of Calcutta, where the Datta family resided. Swamiji's father was a respected lawyer named Vishwanath. He was married to Bhuvaneshwari Devi, a cheerful, devoted, and deeply religious woman. After praying fervently for a son, Narendra Datta was born on January 12, 1863 on Makar Sankrati Day. Little did they know Narain would usher in a new age of spiritual consciousness throughout the world. He enthralled the audience at the Chicago Parliament of Religions with his lecture, his discourses, and that was the beginning of a series of discourses at different parts in the West. And among them, what caught people's attention to a great extent is something which is very much related to our area of operation, that is education. Now a little word about that particular day, 11th of September, 1893. In fact, we remember 11th of September 2001 for the dastardly attack on the Twin Towers. And it was definitely a very tragic incident. More than 3,000 innocent people had lost their lives. But we should not forget about 11 September 1893, which we consider as the day of resurrection of India. And not only that particular day, the entire Parliament of Religions, which continued up to 28th of September 1893, was a situation which definitely put India on the world spiritual map. Now, when we go to discuss about Swamiji's concept of education, we see that several eminent scholars have deliberated on Swami Vivekananda's concept of education. So for this particular topic, I had to think that what new I can tell about Swami Vivekananda's thoughts of education. The first thing that came to my mind that he was a great teacher, a guru. Now, who is a guru? GU means darkness and RU it's remover. So guru means the remover of darkness or the torch bearer. Now, what kind of a guru? What kind of a teacher? Well, let us know from his ardent disciple, Sister Nivedita. She was an Irish lady, as we all know. We are observing her 150th anniversary from 28th of October 2016. Now she says that in Shami Vivekananda's discourses, there was an inexhaustible flow of interpretation. So he used to look upon things from a holistic angle. That is, for a particular situation, for a particular topic, there would not be a single interpretation. There would be an inexhaustible flow of interpretation. But more importantly, he was by no means indifferent as to the minds he was addressing. That is, he had tremendous concern for his audience. Anybody raising a particular question was always appreciated by Shami Vivekananda, and which shows that he was a quality teacher. Now again, coming back to the issue that what new can be said about 
Shami Vivekananda's Thoughts on Education. On your screen, you can see a series of names of scholars, very, very eminent scholars who have deliberated on Shami Vivekananda's Thoughts of Education. Leading that is the French Nobel laureate, Roma Rolla, the great scholar, Christopher Isherwood, then Sister Gargi, who is otherwise known as Mary Louis Barque. She had written two volumes, Shami Vivekananda in America, The New Discoveries. And then Sister Nivedita, that Irish lady about which we had talked a little while earlier. The famous historian, Ramesh Chandra Mojumdar. The famous author and main of literature, Ashit Bandhavadhyay Shankari Prashad Boshu. And the very, very eminent saint scholars, Shami Ranganathananda, Shami Lokeshwaranando, they have already left for their heavenly abode. And the present general secretary of Ramakrishna Math and Mission, Shami Prabhananda. Well, the list is even longer, but they have deliberated on different aspects of Shami Vivekananda's thoughts on education. So I was wondering that what can be new about his ideas, which I can present. So I felt that I would pick up some of his sayings, some of his sayings on education and would try to relate that with real life situations, with real life examples. And I'll establish thereby that how relevant are Shami Vivekananda's sayings. See, the Chicago Parliament of Religion, which brought him into the world map, that was held on 11th of September, 1893, and he passed away on 4th of July, 1902. So within the span of eight or nine years, all these discourses were made from where I have picked up the sayings. And I repeat that I have tried to relate it to the real life situations, real life examples. The first such is the most cardinal definition of education given by Shami Vivekananda. Education is the manifestation of perfection already in man. Education is the manifestation of perfection already in man. This was spelled out by him in 1894. Just think that in the year 1996, that is 102 years later, a UNESCO Convention for Education and the name of that UNESCO Convention was Learning the Treasure Within. It was supposed to have given direction for the nature of education in the entire globe for the 21st century. And the theme was learning the treasure within. Just compare that with what Shami Vivekananda had said more than 100 years before. That is, education is the manifestation of perfection already in man. So now let us see how this is relevant. As I said that, I will try to relate his sayings with real life situations. Now first I direct your attention to the famous book by Jacob Bronowski. You can see Bronowski on the screen, The Ascent of Man and the famous construction which also you can see on the screen. Now Ascent of Man was made into a 13 part serial by BBC and which has included chronologically the different stages of the civilization of humankind. And one particular reference has been made to the Renaissance period when the Masons, the Wandering Masons, W-A-N-D-E-R, the Wandering Masons who would be moving to different parts and creating magnificent architecture. And the one which you can see on the screen is one such. Now, it would be having different kind of designs, the Gothic design being one among them, and from where several mathematical principles have evolved. So, the perfection was already there. It is not only the perfection in the man, but it is the manifestation of perfection which is hidden there. And this can be further elaborated by another example which also dates back to that particular period. And that is about the person whom you are seeing on the screen. He is none other than Michelangelo. Now, Michelangelo's father was a quarry man, Q-U-A-R-R-Y. 
So they used to prepare, they used to create different structures from the stones. And uh, Michelangelo would help his father, his other colleagues. But at certain times, he would just drift away from the group of the persons working in the quarry and would create his own sculpting. And the colleagues of Michelangelo's father would allow him, would let him to do his work because they had realized the talent in him. And by so doing, one day they found that Michelangelo has created this. Now this particular structure is called the head of Brutus. You can see the kind of structure that was made by Michelangelo. And Michelangelo himself along with every person around him, his father, his colleagues had commented that it was already there. Michelangelo had perfected it. It was already there. Michelangelo had perfected it. So, this perfection rests in the person, in his attitude, in his way of functioning and as well as in inanimate objects around us. So, we have to manifest that perfection within. If you happen to be at a place called Kumatuli in Kolkata, where the images of the goddesses are made, say you are there before the Durga Puja. Now, you will find at the last stages of preparation that they would be giving finishing touches, touches to the images and they would be painting with the brushes and you may wonder whether at all any paint is getting there on the image, any paint is getting added to the image. But then it is the manifestation of perfection by the image maker, by the painter. Now let us see this example. Now this is Nadia Komaniki, the 14 year old girl who had created sensation in the Montreal Olympics in 1976. Now she is the first gymnast to have scored a perfect 10 and I am relating that perfect 10 with Shami Vivekananda's concept of perfection. Now how did she attain perfection? Now before I explain that, let us also try to understand that how rating in gymnastics is done. Well, it is not an objective event like 100 meters race that one who crosses the finishing line first gets the gold medal. So it is a subjective event for which assessment is made by a team of judges. Normally, there are seven judges who give marks out of 10. And out of the seven marks, the maximum and the minimum are taken away and the average of the remaining five is taken to be the score. Now, Nadia Komaniki has scored a perfect 10 and every gymnast had to perform eight compulsory exercises. So, eight into seven, 56 times she was assessed and she must have scored 10 out of 10 in all of them, whereby she scored a perfect 10. Now, her attaining of perfection depends on her sincerity, well, her exercise regime, her uh, regime of practice, her following the instruction from her coach and so on and so forth and also availability of the right kind of instrument which is so much crucial for gymnastics. You can see she is performing the vaulting horse on the screen. But what about this person? Now when Sachin executes a perfect cover drive, well it is a poetry in motion. You can see the ball racing to the boundary and all the fielders are just standing. It is indeed a poetry in motion. But does all drive end up in the boundary? Some may end up at a catch to the fielder. Some may end up at the hand of the fielders. Some shot may be missed altogether. It can be a snick leading to a catch to the wicket keeper or the slip fielder. Now does that mean that there was absence of perfection? No. Perfection has been manifested but in Sachin's case as against Nadia's case, well the attaining of perfection depends on correct reading of the bounce of the ball, of the swing of the ball, correct reading of the field placement and several other factors. Like you will find that there are several cancer survivors. 
who have survived due to successful surgery. But there are instances where unfortunately the surgery was not successful. Now does that mean that the element of perfection was missing from the team of doctors? No. It depends on other factors like the condition of the patient when the disease was detected, other facilities at the hospital and so on and so forth. So perfection is already within the man and it has to be manifested and that is education according to Shami Vivekanandu. I repeat, education is the manifestation of perfection already in man. Now let us come to this particular saying, which again is very much in tune with the concept of education. Knowledge is inherent in man. Knowledge is inherent in man. No knowledge comes from outside. It is all inside. Now let us take the example of Isaac Newton and his two famous achievements, his two famous accomplishments. There are many of Sir Isaac Newton. I have just picked up two laws of motion and the universal law of gravitation. It was said that it was in the year 1665, uh, more than 350 years from now, when there was a plague in London and that led to more than 70,000 people getting killed and most of them fled London. Isaac Newton was one among them and he had gone back to his native village and where on a particular afternoon he was sitting under the under, under an apple tree when an apple had fallen on his head and that gave him the idea. Well, it is not that the idea of gravitation struck him because gravitation is what we call as a world point of view. It cannot be the work of a single person. But what struck him is that, well, the way the apple is falling towards the earth is the same as the moon is also falling towards the earth. I repeat, the moon is falling towards the earth in the same manner as the apple falls towards the earth. And that is why it is called the universal law of gravitation. Now the question is that depending on the works by other stalwarts like Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, Tycho Brahe and so on and so forth, Isaac Newton had come to the formulation of the universal law of gravitation. Now does that mean that from the very day and it was in 1665 and finally it took a particular shape by way of the publication of Principia in 1687. So does that mean that the phenomena of gravitation became effective from then only? Definitely not. It was very much there. The phenomena of gravitation was very much there. It was inherent. As Shami Vivekananda has said, knowledge is inherent. Newton only discovered it. So knowledge is inherent. It is not coming from outside. Same with the example of Einstein's phenomenal special theory of relativity or the general theory of relativity or the photoelectric equation and several such things. In fact, the year 1905 is considered as the year of miracles when five phenomenal papers of Albert Einstein got published. Well, we should not digress to that. But the special theory of relativity acted as an iconoclast and had broken the tenets of classical physics, most of which was propounded by Sir Isaac Newton. Well, that's a different story altogether. But again, the most phenomenal achievement of special theory of relativity was to postulate the relative aspect of length, relative aspect of time, relative aspect of simultaneity. But all those things being relative, there was something which was stated to be absolute, that is the velocity of light. Now again, this absoluteness of the velocity of light, did it come from outside? Did it become absolute and it also became the fundamental translational factor between space and time? Now did it become absolute or what I said just now, the fundamental translational factor between space and time ever since Sir Einstein had postulated the special theory? 
definitely not. It was inherent, but it came to be known when Einstein has postulated it. The same is true for the other theories of Einstein. And let us look at the screen now. You see Srinivas Ramanujan, the famous Indian mathematician. Well, he did miracles and he was called the wizard of numbers. And there is an interesting story about what we call as Ramanujan's number. It is 1729. Now, he was in London and most of the party spent in London, he was not well. Uh, he was mentored by another famous mathematician, G. H. Hardy. And G. H. Hardy was not only mentoring him from the point of view of mathematics, but also from the point of view of his health. When Ramanujan remains hospitalized for the uh, best part of his stay in London, and he was scolded almost every day by Hardy that you are not taking medicine properly, you are not taking food properly. So one such day when Hardy had come to visit Ramanujan at the hospital, well, Ramanujan was quite cheerful, but Hardy came and just sat silently by the side of his bed in a chair. Now, Ramanujan asked, what happened? Every day you come and scold me, but today I am cheerful. Why are you looking so morose? Now, Hardy said that, no, you are a wizard of numbers, but today I came in a taxi and I found the number to be quite boring. In fact, the word he used is that it is a very bad omen, O-M-E-N. So, Ramanujan asked, what was that number? The number was 1729. Ramanujan said that you are calling it a bad omen. There cannot be a more exciting number than this. There are very few numbers which can be expressed as sum of two cubes in two different ways. And 1729 is the least among them. It can be expressed as 1000 plus 729, that is 10 cube plus 9 cube. And 1728 plus 1, that is 12 cube plus 1 cube. Now just, and from then onwards, it came to be known as Ramanujan's number. Now just think that 1729 getting represented in these two ways. So it had already been there. It was inherent in that number. It was only Ramanujan who had observed it and who had explained it. So it was very much inherent. It did not come from outside. So let us make a recap of what we have discussed so far. We had chosen two sayings of Shami Vivekananda on education. The first one was what I referred to as his cardinal definition of education. Education is the manifestation of perfection already in man. And the second one was about knowledge being inherent, knowledge being within, knowledge being inside and not coming from outside. So these are the most two crucial statements made by Shami Vivekananda. I have picked up examples from real life situations to establish that whatever Shami Vivekananda had said have been relevant. So I have been able to establish that whatever Shami Vivekananda had said through that cardinal definition is relevant in different walks of life be it that for a sports person, be it that for a scientist, be it that for a sculptor, be it that for a mathematician and so on and so forth. And the same holds about knowledge being inherent. So what we will be doing next is that we would be picking up similar few sayings and we will try to relate them with real life situation. So we will be doing that in the next part of this talk, but let me brief you what all we would be picking up there. The first thing on which we shall be concentrating there is the holistic aspect of education. And this holistic aspect of education is followed in all the schools and other institutions run by Ramakrishna Mission, which follows the ideals of Shami Vivekananda. Apart from the curricular study, they do lot of extracurricular activities and lot of things which are required for building of character. Then we will be talking about self-reliance, 
how education can teach someone to become self-reliant. The third thing will be about the thinking faculty of a student. These days, due to the habit of rote learning, the students have forgotten the art of thinking faculty. In fact, it is very much connected with scientific temper. And Shami Vivekananda had a very high degree of scientific temper and he wanted that to be inculcated by the students all over. And in order to inculcate, in order to have scientific temper, one does not need to be a student of science or an experimenter in science or a teacher in science. Any general human being can have scientific temper. So that is another very crucial aspect which we'll be talking about, that is the thinking faculty of a learner. And then, in order to make this education relevant for the entire nation, which has a secular characteristics, we have to remember this very deeply, that the entire nation has a secular characteristics, and that gets reflected in one of the sayings of Shami Vivekananda, and we'll show that how it becomes relevant in the overall functioning of the nation. The other crucial thing would be learning through experience. There also Shami Vivekananda had made a very, very pointed remark that how one can learn from experience and how that learning becomes more effective than reading from books or learning from a teacher directly through the face-to-face -face mode. And then that would also be backed up by discussions on the relation between instinct and reason, how that analyzes or how that helps in one having a proper kind of education. And that again would be followed up by the real meaning of truth and how education or proper education is able to establish the real truth. And finally, we will conclude by making a mention about the spread of education and how Swamiji has given a clarion call to all those who are educated to some extent to spread that among the masses. So these are the features we will be taking care of in the second part of this talk, Shami Vivekananda's thoughts on education. Thank you. हिंदुस्तान के हर कोने में नौजवानों के पास प्रतिभा है उन्हें अवसर चाहिए NIOS देता रहा है युवाओं को अवसर आगे बढ़ने का NIOS से पढ़ने वाले इन युवाओं ने किया है संस्थान को गौरवान्वित दिव्यांगों ने बनके दिखाया है सबल और आत्मनिर्भर NIOS के साथ आप भी जुड़िए NIOS के संग